today um I want to look at the um, the topic um it's kind of like a oxymoron for Adventism it's called um communicating with the dead legally Is it legal to have communion with the dead? Hello? But today I will show you a way in which we can communicate with the dead. And it's legal. Oh, folks probably thinking, what's she going to present here? <laughs> but the grace of God, let us pray lead, alright? Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask for your Holy Spirit to take full control. We ask that you will beat back the powers of darkness. Give us the strength, give us the grace. I ask that the word I'll present will lodge within each and every heart. I ask that when all is said and done, that your name will be honored, glorified, and magnified. And that I will decrease and Christ will always increase. We ask in these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yes, so we all know now. Can someone really communicate with the dead? You see, there are a whole lot of folks that believe that they can communicate with the dead. You know? They believe that their dead loved ones can come back and have communion with them. You see, I grew up in a society full of superstition, full of mysticism, full of satanic delusion. I grew up listening to a whole lot of Creole folk tales. Folk said that after a certain hour of the night, a lady will come up with a cow foot. You know? And if you meet her, she's going to kill you. You know, um, I grew up in a village where they said there was a night puppy. There was a man behind the corner. He'll come out every night, a dead man. As a little child, I was terrified of these stories. You know, especially on the point of communion with the dead. You know, where individuals believe that the dead ones can come back and have communion with them. That the dead can speak to them and they believe that the dead can even come back and make love to them. You know, one time I was, one of my good friends, my colleague of mine, he said that, Brother Vic, um, he said that his friend, he had a friend that, that his friend died. So he said to me at all, he was trying to convince the guy that when you're dead, you're dead. But his friend would never believe that because he said, the, the friend was, um, his friend had died. My friend, his friend had died. And while he was preparing to go to his friend's funeral, when he looked up, he saw the guy sitting on the bed. He saw the dead man sitting on the bed. And he said, man, what are you doing here? Hurry up, I'm coming to your funeral. So he said he was trying to convince this guy that no, that wasn't what you saw. You saw um, a satanic demon. But he couldn't convince that man. He believed that he can communicate with the dead. Now, this deception of immortality of the soul is one of Satan's subtle deception in these last days. But as Adventists, God has given us the His Word. He has given us His light, especially on the communication of the dead. And we know the role that is going to play in end time prophecy. You know, God has given to us his word to navigate us through these trying days of earth's history. So, let us look at um, the, the definition of the state of the dead from just, just from the dictionary. The definition of the state of the dead. And this is what the, um, I got from the dictionary. They said that Derive what well, deprive of life. You see, no longer what alive, a dead tree, dead soldiers, missing and presuming. All these are the definitions for someone being dead. 
having appearance of deadly in a dead faint lacking power to move feel or respond my arm feels dead you know like sometimes you get up your arms feels dead all these all these just from a secular level these are the the the, the um the definition of the word dead so i don't understand why people feel that when they're dead they come alive you know incapable of being stirred emotionally intellectually unresponsive a hard dead to pity felt, um, felt dead inside so all these are the meaning from a secular level of the word dead but we are also living in a time in which we are seeing uh, a crisis is building in God's church because we have some dead pastors <laughs> we have some dead spiritual leaders and since the church will not grow above its leaders, all those who, call, who fall under those dead pastors, brothers and sisters, unless we allow God to arouse us, we will be dead also. So here we have a situation where we have dead preaching pastors preaching to a dead people. It's a very serious situation that we are in. And God is calling upon all these pastors and elders. One pastor was saying to me the other day, you were saying, man, you used to believe that 2200 day prophecy. I said, I said, yes. He said to me because um, he believes that after the disappointment that Ellen White and they came together just to um, cook up this story about the investigator judgment. Adventist pastor with a church. He believed that they just came together and just cook up this story to remove the embarrassment. I said, You teach us to your people? He said, No. But I'm just trying to say the mindset of pastors nowadays. Because really, actually, I asked what I asked him was like, if, So if you're trying to tell me that um, the, the, the investigative judgment and Christ moving into the most holy place in 1844 it is a lie. Then really what you are really saying to me is that the very the servant of the Lord, the, her writings also is a lie. That's what you're saying. Because it has been confirmed in her writings. And many other pastors have this theology. And, it's, and, and it is the work of the man called Desmond Ford. And God is calling our pastors to be awake. As faithful sentinel in the walls of Zion. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is fast spent. The day is at hand. So let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. And put on the armor of light. Which is found in who? It is found only in Christ Jesus. So those who are communicating with it. I want to get back to the subject of the dead. Who or what they are really communicating with? Are they communicating with their loved ones? The dead loved ones or relatives? Or are they really communicate with evil, wicked, demonic spirits? You see, the Bible is very clear. And it gives warning to the danger of communicating with those that have familiar spirits. And of the dangers of dealing with the occult world or the spirit world. And we saw in the Old Testament, brothers and sisters, where King Saul, the first king of Israel, lost his life because he decided to reject the counsel of the Lord and choose the counsel of a spirit medium. So the Bible is to know Bible is to first Samuel verse first Samuel chapter twenty. And it came to pass in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare. Keep reading. Fight with Israel and Ashish said unto David, No thou assure thee that thou shalt go out with me battle and thy men. And David said unto Ashish, Surely thou shalt know what I saw and can do. And Ashish said to David, There will I make thee keeper of my head. Yes. <laughs> Verse 3. No. Samuel was dead. But for Samuel was what? Dead. Dead. Okay. And all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul put up 
will always those that had familiar spirit and the visit of the life. Yes. Verse 5. Verse, verse 4. Then gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shuna. And some gathered all Israel together and they pitched in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by urine, nor Amen. by prophets. Then Saul said unto his servant, Seek me a woman that had a familiar spirit, hmm. that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said unto him, yeah, it's a woman that have had a familiar spirit in Enlo. Okay, right, you, you can stop there. Now, now let's 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 take a look at verse three. The Bible says in verse three, what the Bible says that Samuel was what? Dead. I mean, I mean, Samuel was dead, right? So, so notice also in verse 3, King Saul, uh, King Saul was, when he was faithful to God, he played his part in putting to death all of those that familiar spirits and wizards in the land. Right? But when he saw the host of the Philistines gather for war, what happened? He was afraid. And he trembled for his life, brothers and sisters. He was paralyzed with fear. And, and King Saul in his desperation resorted to the very same evil that he once destroyed. Because you were dead too. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And he did an abominable act, brothers and sisters, as a dog returned to his vomit. He returned to the he, he turned from the living God to seek counsel from a witch. To seek counsel from one who had made a deal with the devil. To see counsel from one who had entered into an unholy covenant with Satan. For what the God, word of God declared in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 10, and 11, 10 to 12. The Bible says, There shall not be found among you anyone that what? Make it a son or his daughter pass through a fire. Or use it? Divination. Or an observer of or a enchanter, or a, or a, or a counselor with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are what? Abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God do it, drive them out from behind thee. So all of the nations, the hidden nations around it, these were their practices. Notice also in verse 6. Keep down to verse 6. Well, King Saul tried to inquire of the Lord. But the Lord did not answer his servant. Now one got to ask themselves why. After all, the Lord promised that he will never leave us nor forsake us. But here we have a situation where the, where, 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 where the servant of the Lord inquired the Lord and the Lord turned his back on him. My brothers and sisters, it was due to King Saul's rebellious ways. God, I want to cut off all his channels of communication. Therefore, God sent him no dreams, no Europe, and no prophet was sent. Brothers and sisters, when he was alive, when Samuel was alive, he totally rejected the, the counsel of Samuel. He had David on the run like, on a, like a fugitive for no legitimate reason. I remember checking um, 1 Samuel chapter 22. They said that he had even slain the priest of the Lord. So when he was looking for God, there was not a word from heaven to ease his troubled spirit. Therefore, he felt alone. He felt abandoned. He felt unprotected heading into that battle. 
This is why it's so important for us, brothers and sisters, for us to seek the Lord while he may be found. There will come a time when we are looking for him and he will not be there. Now, look at, let's look. Notice in verse 7. Notice in verse 7 that King Saul had made the fatal mistake by seeking counsel from a spirit medium. And that's when he went too far. Then King Saul said unto his servant, Seek me a woman that had a familiar spirit, that I may go unto her and inquire of her. So in other words, what you say, really send, send me a, a, a psychic. Send me a voodoo priest. Send me a obi a woman. The servant said unto him, Behold, here is a woman in, with a familiar spirit at Endor. You see, I grew up in a, in a, in a, in a culture, Brother Vespi, where somebody could always say, I know a man can help you. <laughs> I know a woman that can help you. you know? One of my clients, this guy, I keep hearing say, Boy, uh, you have this spiritual mother in Trinidad. He said, I'll call, he said, I'll call my spiritual mother and talking to my spiritual mother. But I keep asking, why, who is this spiritual mother? Every time I see me talking to the spiritual mother, the spiritual mother. When the man bus arrived, the man was talking to her, a woman. He has called up in Trinidad for guidance. And you know, there are a lot of world leaders who are doing the very same thing. I'd be surprised that Joe Biden is doing the very same thing. Now in, verse, now in verse 8, we saw where King Saul disguised himself and put on raiment. And he took two of his servants by night and they made their way to this woman that made a deal with the devil. And that night was going to be his last night, brothers and sisters. That night was going to be a night when King Saul totally placed himself on Satan's side of the great controversy. Where he placed himself on forbidden ground. He placed himself on enchanted ground. And Satan took full possession of his heart. Brothers and sisters, we have to be careful that we are not opening channels for the devil to come into our homes. We have to be very careful, brothers and sisters. We are not opening channels for the devil to come into our hearts. So the TV shows, yes. the music we listen to, the conversation we have, the friends we have, yes. some friends we just cut them off. Because yes. after a while you're going to start to share in the very same spirit. Yes. So we got to be so careful. The pen of inspiration declared that the woman suspected that her visitor was Saul and his rich gifts, gifts strengthened her suspicion. So King Saul went to the woman and introduced himself to this woman that had made a deal with the devil. And, and, and she said unto him, Who shall I divine unto thee? Now notice in verse 11. Let's look at verse 11. After we know when the very Bible states very clearly that King that Samuel was dead. Now, King Saul. He had every opportunity to seek counsel from Samuel when he was alive and well. Now you wait till he's dead to go to a witch to seek counsel from him when he was dead. Went to an agent of Satan to seek counsel from her. In other words, he went from the living to the dead. Verse 13, the verse 13, skip down to verse 13. Then the Obia woman said unto um he, he, she said she saw girl, gods ascending out of the earth. She saw an old man coming up, and he has covered with a mantle. And King Saul perceived that it was Samuel. See? He perceived that it was Samuel. But was it, this, was it the prophet of the Lord that he saw? No. What had appeared unto King Saul at night, that apparition, it was the work of Satan. This supernatural appearance was produced by the diabolical power of Satan, brothers and sisters. Masquerading as Samuel 
for the sole purpose of deception. You know, Satan is a deceiver. Sometimes he can even make holograms of a satanic nature. We got to be so careful, brothers and sisters. Satan's power to make us see things, brothers and sisters. Remember one time my sister's husband had died back in the early 90s, Brother Vespi. And we went up to our sister, you know, family. We went up to our sister. And uh, I remember one night, you know, we had been with the funeral preparation, the wake and everything to help out the consoler. And I remember one night we were talking to him, we was asking her um, so he, he, his name was Elroy. So we asked her, so you miss Elroy? She said, yes, but I saw him. I said, what? She said, I saw him in the back step um, earlier. I said, what? So I went I went to snow in the house. It had like about 30 of us was in the house that night. <laughs> so I went to bed. But I think my nephew used to be in that same room too. And he had another partner here came up. So we all three used to sleep in that room there. So that night I got up, I saw nobody in the room. So I went to the other rooms. I saw nobody. I'm like, where everybody going? I had in the house. I started getting scared. But when I went in my sister's room, I about 50 people in that room. Because they talk because she says she saw the dead. And everybody was inside the room. And what do you think I did? I squeezed my way in and find a place to stay. I think I slept with my hands on the bed. <laughs> because what? The scale of the dead. Brothers and sisters, it's a serious thing, you know. It's a very serious, serious thing. So, 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 so this thing, this operation probably, it probably looked like Samuel. It probably walked like Samuel, talked like Samuel, probably even smelled like Samuel, brothers and sisters. But it was not Samuel. And if King Saul thought that he was going to run to that spread medium and receive any good news, he was fooling himself, brothers and sisters. Now, 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 he was, he was caught in a situation where he couldn't run to God for help and he couldn't even run to the devil for help. Caught between the proverbial rock and a hard place. Now, 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 in verse 25, Let's, let's take a um, look at verse 25. Then the foolish king went even a bit further and he decided to eat the bread that the devil need. My mama always said to me, boy, when you don't listen, you're going to eat the bread that the devil need. I, brother, I believe that all those who are taking this vaccine all those who are being inoculated with this thing they're going to eat the bread that the devil need in the very near future now a very important lesson here for us to learn is that because after if you notice in verse 18 to 20 the, 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 the witch made or the, the spirit medium let him know what was going to happen to him in the battle and I'm asking someone read it for me verse uh, verse 18 to 20 someone read it for me First Samuel 20 verse 18 to 20 because thou hearest not the voice of the Lord thou executest his fierce word for Amalek mm -hmm. therefore hath the Lord done this
That's verse 20? Yeah. Right, right. So, 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 what we are seeing here is that when Satan sees that he got an individual fully in his power or fully in his snare, sometimes Satan can even come and let you know the truth about yourself. Sometimes you let you know that you're an addict. You are in disgrace. You ain't nothing, ain't nothing good about you, brothers and sisters. Satan even, you even inspire people to say these things to you. Yeah. And not with the intention for the individual to reform or the intention or the intention for the individual to make a positive change for the better, but to discourage you. To, 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 to disappoint you. To demoralize you, to break your spirit, and to show your hopeless condition, and to show you your hopeless situation. Satan will do that. But, brothers and sisters, we as Christians, we should never, ever allow one word of discouragement to come off our lips to anyone. Speak words of hope. Speaks words that will encourage people. Speak words that will offer grace unto the heroes. Let us never ever discourage anyone. Because that's exactly what the devil did to King Saul. Because he placed himself on forbidden ground, brothers and sisters. Now, King Saul went into the battle after Kong, Kong, uh, Kong after having come from one who had a familiar spirit. He was separated from a source of all strength. He was unable to lead the soldiers to the God of Israel, the helper. And the evil prediction of that which was fully accomplished. Because it was upon the plain of Shuram on the slopes of Gilborah that both armies of Israel clashed in mortal combat. King Saul fought desperately for his throne. He fought desperately for his kingdom, but it was all in vain. He saw all his soldiers, his brave soldiers, one by one got cut down by the sword. His two sons got cut down by the sword. He himself, he got wounded by the archer, one arrow, unable to fight or flight. He bared his armor draw to grab a sword and to kill me. Do you know what it is to ask someone to kill you? And so the word God declares in First Chronicles chapter 10 verse 13 to 14, the Bible says, and so, so Saul died for what? For his transgression which he committed against the Lord, even against the will of the Lord, which he what? Kept not. And also asking counsel of one that had had a what? For many spirit to inquire of it. And he inquired not of the Lord. Therefore, he slew him and turned the kingdom unto David the son of Jesse. Brothers and sisters, he begged his armor bearer to trust him through the sword. And so the life of the first king of Israel came to an end. His life of dishonor, his life of disgrace, because he decided to seek counsel from one who had a familiar spirit. Now, the Bible is very clear upon what happens to someone when they die. Amen? Mm -hmm. We know that when you die, when you're dead, you're dead. Yes. Ain't no coming back when you're dead. The word of God declares. In, in, in Psalms 15, 115 verse 17, the dead prays, not the Lord, neither anyone that go down into Psalms 146 and verse 4, his breath going forth, he returned to his earth. In that very day, what? So when you die, in that very day, your thoughts 
perish, right? Also, as we read in the um in the scripture reading, for for to him that is joined to all that is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perish. Neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. So the Bible is very clear, brothers and sisters, right? Because we must understand the state of the dead as we head down into the time of trouble. Now, let me read you a very powerful statement from the pen of inspiration. Very powerful statement from God's messenger. But none need to be deceived by the lying claims of spiritualism, right? Which means coming here with the dead. God has given the, the, the world sufficient light to enable them to discover the snare. As already shown, the theory which forms the very foundation of spiritualism is at war with the plainest statements of the scripture. All right, the Bible declares that the dead know nothing. We just read it. Okay. Also, she goes on to say, the very name of witchcraft is now held in contempt. The claim that men can hold intercourse with evil spirits regardless as a fable of the dark ages, right? But spiritualism, which numbers is converts by hundreds of thousands, yea, by millions, which has made its way into scientific circles, which has invaded churches and has found favor in what? Legislative bodies. So even among the, the, the governors and even among the senators, brothers and sisters, you are men who are having communion with the dead, right? And even the course of kings, this mama deception is but a revival in a new disguise of the witchcraft condemned and prohibited of all. We might be playing around with it, but the Bible deals with it in a very serious thing and the pen of inspiration. One more statement from, the, from God's messenger. If men had been willing to receive the truth so plainly stated in the scripture concerning the nature of man and the state of the dead, they would see in the claims and manifestations of spiritualism the working of Satan with the power and signs and what? Lying, Lying wonders. Right? But rather they yield the liber liberty so agreeable to the carnal heart and renounce the sins which they love. Multitudes close their eyes to the light and walk straight on, regardless of the warnings while Satan waves his snares about them and they become his prey. Because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Therefore, God shall what? Send them strong delusion that they may believe a lie. Why? I'm saying, why even try communion with, commune with the dead when we have a living God we can turn to? Now, spiritualism is one of those sins that constitute the wine of Babylon. You agree? It constitutes the wine of Babylon. And God is calling our people out of this false system of worship. And into his truth in, this last, in these last days. This last even found this way's root all the way back to Eden. So the Bible has given us warning of the danger of communicating with the dead. Because really and truly when you're dead, you're what? Dead. You're dead. The eyes, of, I mean, the eyes of the Lord, it is an abomination. Is it legal in heaven to have communication with the so-called dead? But also, we are looking at another dead. I spoke about it before, but I also want to speak about this death again because there are some dying pastors or dead pastors, I should say, and they are preaching to a dying people. The 
cast in the world to arouse the people to a sense that there is danger ahead. They refuse to preach the strict cutting truth for the times in which we are living. And therefore, God is going to find other ways in which to get the truth out. You're going to find in these last days here, stones going to rise and start crying out. They refuse to give the trumpet a certain song. The world to arouse people to the sense of their danger. They refuse to give them sense of God. I'm wondering when are these pastors going to wake up? We are living in such perilous times. We are seeing the rise of crime. We are seeing the unsettled state of society. I was talking to our brother and sister the other night. And we are going through the testimonies. And we took one statement from the power of inspiration and we spoke about it. One paragraph. And we spoke about it about for a whole hour and a half. Because it was so rich and so powerful. And despite all that we are seeing, we are questioning when will these dry bones ever wake up? When will these pastors ever wake up? Maybe they are waiting for the close of human probation. I don't know. But today, by the grace of God, I want to show you another communication with the dead that is legal. We went up, we went and we saw the, the aspect of the, the uh, uh, communication with them, which is illegal. But today, by the grace of God, I want to introduce it to you a passage of scripture that proves that we can communicate with the dead. All right, let's turn to Romans chapter 8. Turn your Bible quickly to Romans chapter 8. Matter of fact, when you find this, say amen. amen. All right, let us read this text here, brothers. We're going to read this together. And if Christ be in you, Romans chapter 8, verse 10. Sorry. Let's read together. If Christ be in you, the body is what? Hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, let's not go too fast. We're dealing with communicating with the dead now. Right? If Christ be in you, the body is dead. Because of? Sin. But the spirit is? Life. Of? Because righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwelleth in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall? Quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. All right. So, if you be in Christ, the body is dead, okay? Verse 12, therefore, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if we through the spirit do modify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Alright, so, by the way, God works through the Spirit. Right? Satan works through the passions. Alright, Galatians chapter 2, 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, not I, but Christ liveth in me. So in order for Christ to live in you, you must be what? Dead. Dead. Right? And the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the secret to the Christian's life. Brothers and sisters, if we are not crucified we can be saved. If a man of Jesus is only coming back for dead men, as I go on, Galatians 5 24, and that and, and they that are Christ have what? Crucify the flesh with the affection and lust. And if we live in the spirit, let us also 
walk in the spirit. So death to the flesh, alive to the spirit of the living God. So, what is Texas saying here? These Texas are saying you can be physically alive, right? But to the flesh, you are dead. And when this has been accomplished in our hearts, Pastor Kalinda, come. So when Pastor Calendar has been dead to self and I'm talking to him I am talking to a dead man. Oh. And if you're dead then make sure you're dying by the grace of God. Amen. So we will be live, we will be Talking, living, eating, drinking, dead man. Or else we will not be saved. Christ is coming back for dead men and women. Or else we will not be saved. That's why the message of justification by faith is so important. Amen. Let, me, let me examine it. What is justification by faith? It is the work of what? God in laying the glory of me. In what? In the dust. And I put this here from dust thou art. And from and to dust we must return. Right? And doing for man that which is what? Not in his power to do for himself. You, no matter how much we try to save our own selves, we can't be saved. We can't save our own selves. It is the work of God. Okay. And then what? She said, when men see their own what? Lord, I think this. I thought there was something good about me. I thought that my singing and I thought that so, like so, some kind of married me some kind of goodness. But what is something the Lord say? When you see your own, nothing. Nothing. there's nothing good in you. They are prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Long as you think you're something, or I think I'm something, you ain't ready for it to be covered. Those whom heaven recognizes as whole as holy ones are the least to parade your own goodness. Alright then. What this looks like here? Brother Raphael, what this looks like here, my brother? What does this look like, brothers and sisters? A dead man, right? Okay, let me ask some questions. Could this man tell a lie? Why he can't tell a lie? Because he is dead. Okay. Could this man commit adultery or fornication? Why not? You sure? All right. Could this man create this God among the brethren? Why not? Talk to me, somebody. He's dead. Could he be jealous? Could he have animosity in his heart? Why not? You sure? Could he lose his temper? No. Could he gossip? Why not? Dead. 
Um, I got news for you. All of us who are preparing for Christ's second coming, we must become physically alive, but yet still dead. So when the gossip comes, you send it back. You ain't passing it on. When they come stalking all their foolishness, you pass it on. Did you talk to the brother? No. Did you talk to the brother? No, you gotta take it back over there. Because when these people come in there, when they're evil spirit, they infect you too. And so the Lord says, after about you partake in the very same spirit. They say misery loves company. You must be alive to the spirit, but dead to the works of the flesh. Because Jesus is only coming back for dead men and women. Which a powerful statement here from God's messenger. The sin which is indulged indulged to the greatest extent, and that which separates us from God and produces so many contagious spiritual disorders is selfishness. Don't just say it like that. Take your time and pronounce it. It is selfishness. There can be no return to the Lord except by self-denial. Of ourselves, we can do nothing. But through God strengthening us, we can live to do good to others. And in this way, shun the evil of selfishness. We need, we need not to go to hidden lands to manifest our desire to devote all to God in useful, unselfish life. We should not, we should do this in the home circle, in the church, among those whom we associate and whom we do business. So in our everyday life, we must manifest that spirit of unselfishness. Right in the common walks of life is where self is to be denied and kept in subordination. Paul said, I die, die. what? So as you're taking a shower every morning, for those who take a shower every morning, you're dying daily. Your shower is like a symbol of like a rebaptism, right? It is the daily dying to self in the little transaction of life that make us overcomers, right? With many days, a decided lack of love for others, instead of faithfully performing their duty, they seek rather their own. You see, there's an element of self that if you don't be careful, the devil don't use you to destroy you. The greatest enemy we're going to ever face is right in your own heart. The carnal nature. Jesus is coming back for dead men and women. That's the message today. I shall, I shall change the topic. Jesus is coming back for dead men and women. Dead to the spirit. Dead to the flesh. But alive to the spirit. And Jesus has also given to us a very powerful example of, of self being laid in the dust. He declared that what? The prince of this world coming and had seen one from what? Nothing. Nothing in me. And this is the very same condition we must be found in these last days. Alive to the spirit, but dead to the works of the flesh. We must be selfless 
We must be sinless. The glory of man must be laid in the dust. One well, of the reasons why the Lord has placed this word my, on my heart is because of this demon called self. I gotta stress this point. Because this thing refused to die. The more we think that we're on safe ground, brothers and sisters, that's the time when it flares up again. Yes. Me personally, I see if I fly my chest. You know? Self is like a weed. You know, home, you know? When you, when you, when you, when you put in the good, um, like the vegetables down in the ground, you got to put some work in the soil. For weed, you don't need no weed. You don't need no soil to be prepared. We just grows anyway, anyhow. And that's how sin is. All of us who desire to be saved, we'll be walking, living, sleeping, eating, dead men and women. And when this has been finally accomplished in our lives, brothers and sisters, we will be communicating with dead men and women. Self must be crucified. Self must be laid in the dust so that Christ can be lifted up in our lives. Or else none of us here will see God's face. One of the reason why there is so much problems in the church is because of selfishness. Because of this demon called self. Self always wants its own way. It always wants to do its own thing. It's strongly opinionated. You know? They always think that their way is the better way. And folks, when they don't get their own way, just never see them again in the church. They try to find another church. But really and truly, you are running from yourself. Because any other way you go, you're going to see problems. Brothers and sisters, and I bring it home today. As we see what's taking place in this world, we are on the very brink of eternity. Probation is about to close on the Adventist church. But yes, the pastors can't say a word to arouse the people to a sense of their danger. I'm calling upon all pastors of the Seventh Adventist church to awake out of sleep. For now is your salvation nearer than your first belief. The night is far spent. The day is at hand, therefore, wake up. Wake up, brothers. Wake up, pastors. Put on the armor of light. Elders, which is found only in Christ Jesus. Don't let the blood of your members be upon you, Pastor. I'm speaking directly to the camera. So it behoves all of us to examine ourselves. To see if this demon is inside of us. Yes. And ask God to come in and to do that work of cleansing in the heart. And to wash us and to purge us and to cleanse us from all sin and all unrighteousness. So the Bible in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes says, Ecclesiastes 3 says, To everything there is a season. And a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to what? A time, time to die is now to self. A time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill, a time to heal. A time to break down, and a time to build up. The time for self, for self to die is now. The time for self to be crucified is now. Tomorrow has been promised to no one. 
All we have is now. In fact, we, just have, we don't even have the next minute. All we have is this moment. I said to you in the last sermon, every aspect of our lives is under investigation. And let's don't compare ourselves to another man. We're going to find something. We'll look at him and compare himself to us and say, okay, we are doing good. But when you compare yourself to Jesus, you're going to fall on your knees and say, Lord, woe is me. So my appeal today for every man, woman, and child is that self should die and self should be laid in the dust. And when this has been accomplished, brothers and sisters, we will live and reign with God throughout the ceaseless ages of all eternity. Amen? Yeah. So Pastor Kinder, please come and close us out in prayer. Personally, I, I am moved. And I am happy that I am here. And I feel sure that all of us all of us today, individually, happier to be here. As the preacher said, probation is closing on us one by one. One by one. One by one. My, for me, as an individual, my wish my desire is that I walk with the Lord. Walk with the Lord. And my wish for you, as fellow brothers and sisters, that you too walk with the Lord. While you're coming up, we don't ask you to be in comfort. Let us be in God. stand in for us all. 